In this Research Methods podcast, we're going to be talking about designing effective questionnaires, working from the research design process at the very beginning to the tips and tricks necessary to ensure that your questionnaire is successful. So when we begin, I want to take a look at the overview of the survey design process from the research process through reviewing the questionnaire at the end. This gives you a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Designing a good survey can be challenging, but it's also about the heart of what is good research in and of itself. So when we start thinking about the research process as a whole, regardless of whether we're working for a client, whether we're working for academic means, whether we're delivering it in person, on the phone, or online, this really sums up the process for conducting good social science research. All social science research begins with a clear research need. This need might be defined by a client, it might be defined by the academic community, or what is our state of knowledge in any particular subject area. But to make research have a purpose, you need to have a problem that you're trying to solve. It might be a knowledge gap or it might be something quite practical, like increasing sales, improving the relationship with particular stakeholder groups. What is the problem that research can help solve through better information? From there, we need to design a study to ensure that we're meeting those needs. So the goal of good research is alignment of research need to design to who we actually talk to. In the fourth stage, it's about making sure that we're getting participants and respondents who make sense for our problem. Doing then in the fifth step our data analysis in a way that gets out our problem, then reporting it. This loops back into the research need because from an organizational perspective or from an academic perspective, the knowledge that we produce with good survey design and overall good research design always leads on to future information that we could use, other problems that we can solve. Now, if we take this process and think about it in more of a professional context, so evaluating business goals or something that is more very goal-directed material goals, at each stage of the design process, the designer has to consider whether their questionnaire is meeting very specific goals. The other thing that I really want to highlight about this process is that it absolutely has to be geared towards your targeted respondents because they have to buy into it to, number one, get responses to begin with, or number two, get good, rich data. From years of doing market research phone surveys, being the field person talking to a lot of folks, I found that the easiest surveys to get people to answer were ones that were, that were of genuine interest to participants. For example, talking about golfing equipment to golfers, talking about alcohol choices to almost anyone, and so on and so forth. So it's about making your topic of interest and relevance so that it's engaging for your respondents because you're taking up their time. And if you're doing surveys on the phone, online, wherever, it's really easy for them to lose the survey and you lose those responses. So if they're not interested, you're just not going to get very much data or very good data in and of itself. Now, in terms of the types of surveys, we're going to come back to this a little bit later. But there is a lot of difference in what you can do with respondents when you're physically there to control the interaction and when you're not. We'll talk more about these considerations towards the end of the lecture, but it's an important consideration as you're thinking about the process of designing surveys overall. Now, in terms of the parts of a survey, there are three parts that we want to talk about. The first is the informed consent statement or agreement. Remember, no matter the research that you're doing, questionnaires, anything else, you have to give your respondents enough information about the project that they can determine whether it's in their best interests to participate. So this is an opportunity to establish the study's credibility, interest, and relevance to your respondents. So good informed consent statements include, first, a brief statement of who you are, that you're a credible researcher, and after credible ends. Second, the purpose of the questionnaire. Third, what's involved on their part. Fourth, you need to make sure that you explain any risks, costs, or rewards involved for the participant. Fifth, you need to explain how the results will be used. Sixth, you must emphasize that this is voluntary. 
both at the beginning and throughout. And seventh, there's other information that you might need to include. In, For example, if they have questions, complaints, or concerns, how to obtain results, contact information, whatever details would give them the reasonable sense of informed consent. Second, when you're designing your questionnaire, you need to make sure that you provide survey instructions. You need to make sure that while you're trying to simplify the process, that you're not treating your respondents like simpletons, but in general that you're providing clear instructions about what the respondent is supposed to do at the beginning and for each section. If you do this, there are three benefits to you. First, you get more consistent results. Second, you improve the response rates. Few people will read the survey without good prompting and easy to read instructions. And third, you explain how to do the survey in a very user-friendly kind of manner. So if we're thinking about these as the parts of the survey, then it's also about managing the flow of the survey, how the questions are grouped. So we'll go through this part of it in much more detail in just a moment. But it's important to think about all three of these parts at the beginning, how the questionnaire is going to lay out, what it's going to feel like, and certainly how it's going to be maneuvered by the participants. So if we're thinking about managing the flow of the process, the component on here that probably needs the most explaining is creating a smooth cognitive pathway. Put more simply, confusing your participants is a really bad thing. You want the participants to feel comfortable and confident as they're responding to the questions, so you should do everything you can to visually, via instructions, and through ordering your questions, keep it simple and easy to follow. But just as a as important as I've mentioned before, you need to keep the survey interesting or stimulating for your participants. If your participants are really into the questions, the topic in the first place, you can get away with a longer survey. So in part, this is based on how engaged you think your target population will be with the topic, but it's also about making the questions interesting themselves and making respondents feel like they're making a contribution. But doing these first two things in the design of your survey, if you do that, you'll maximize the completion rate. So I know that on the outside, it seems pretty obvious that you would want to get 90 plus percent of the responses, but that's not terribly realistic for any request that you send out. What you want to make sure, though, is that you have done everything you can to get as many people possible. It's getting increasingly difficult to get people to respond to surveys. Even our friends and family, when we put on the emotional blackmail of, please help me or I won't graduate kinds of questions, even then it's getting more difficult to recruit participants without paying for it. But so it's also in part that folks are interested in their own topics of interest and if you have a bad questionnaire, they're just not going to feel particularly charitable about helping you out. The second outcome to good design is that ultimately we want to make sure that we improve the quality of our data. When it comes to any of the reasons that we might be doing research, obviously this is going to be vital. So if we want to think about how to manage the length of the questionnaire, there are three tips to make. First, keep it brief. Most of the time, we figure that once we have them, we may as well cram everything possible onto the survey. Look, this is going to reduce your response rate, and this is coming from someone who likes to write a long questionnaire. Ask the bare minimum questions you need in order to accomplish the goals that you have for the survey. Second, be linear. One of the mistakes that a lot of people make in trying to keep their survey interesting is that they'll hop around from topic to topic in a way that doesn't make much sense. The rule of thumb is that you want to start with the broadest topics that you have first, and then you narrow as you move deeper into the survey. For example, if you're trying to get market opinion, you might start with a broad category of goods, services, move to brand, and then specifics of a brand. If you do this, you can help the cognitive flow. Third, if you have long or difficult sections, change up the activity periodically so there's a decent rhythm to the experience. For example, if you have a somewhat repetitive task in a questionnaire, provide a breather activity that's easier, lighter, and helps trans to transition into the next section. From there, we also think about, beyond managing the length of the questionnaire, how to use verbal and visual signposts within the 
questionnaire, and there are a number of tips to help here. First, make sure that you clearly communicate the structure of the survey. Explain what's going to happen. This is partly in your cover letter, but also as you're going through with each section, explain what you're doing and what the purpose of the section is. Second, make sure that you let respondents know they're making progress. If you're doing questionnaires online, add in the progress bar. Um, I've made the mistake of leaving it out before, and people get very frustrated. They don't know how much longer they have to go, at least in terms of percentages, and so they're much more likely to abandon the questionnaire, and that leaves you with some data problems. Third, set localized expectations. For each section, you might want to summarize what's the task and what they can expect. Then finally, provide encouragement. Remind them that they're making valuable contributions to the research, to you, to, to the topic, you know, whatever is relevant in terms of the problem that you're going to solve. Make sure that they are reminded of the positive outcomes of their participation. Now, in, when we're talking about participation, you also want to be careful of avoiding huge batteries of questions. When we say battery of questions, this is a good example of it, where you have this kind of a, a single lead in thinking back to your experience with a particular shop, indicate how much you agree or disagree with the following statements, and then you write a whole bunch of them. So these are pretty standard in a lot of online questionnaires, but sometimes you may want to avoid these, and there are three reasons for this. First, they can be tiresome. They take time and they just look onerous. This is where the perception of difficulty and length of the survey can really hurt both response rate and dropout rates. Also, one thing that I've noticed is that researchers will ask long, long batteries, and then you have to scroll up to find the anchors again. That can be really annoying, but it also reduces the response rate and the reliability, because if people forget which end of the scale strongly agree to strongly disagree is which, they can end up flipping those around. So you might just get bad results. Second, these encourage satisficing behaviors. So satisficing behaviors are those where folks are just filling in the responses to complete the survey. The satisficing theory suggests that respondents tend to assume that the main option is probably the correct option, so the easiest response is to simply agree. It's a really passive way to have people respond to the survey, so they're much less likely to actually think about the questions, and that's going to hurt your validity and your reliability. And third, there can be anchoring effects. Basically, anchoring effects is that your answer for the first question influences your answers for the rest of the battery. There are loads of reasons for this, but people like consistency. So if they pick one answer to start, they'll often want to stick with that response and again, this minimizes both the validity and the reliability of your questionnaires. So if we're thinking about alternatives to batteries of questions, think about making it visual. The exercise here is basically a matching exercise. Right now it's set up for an online kind of survey, but you could do this in a paper pen kind of questionnaire as well. Think about it like a basic matching test, where you'd have four brands on one side and the words on the other, and you could have respondents either draw lines or number the responses and write them down. Now this one work well on the phone because it's visual. But the basic idea is that you get folks to answer the same kinds of questions that they would in giant batteries, but this kind of a setup has three advantage over batteries of questions. First, they are more intuitive because each of your test products, people can see them and they can see the way that the brands are laid out, they can see the words, and they can choose whether or not they think it applies. The basic scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree can sometimes be awkward for some questions and some topics. This lets people make simpler decisions that genuinely are more comparative. Second, these handle a lot more data. Because of the visual layout, on a single page with a happy flowing white space, you can actually ask a whole lot of questions. Think about a battery layout for, for each of the brands that you're talking about. You'd have a scale question, and you'd end up basically with 80 questions off of the same information that's being asked here. Imagine what that would look like. 
So this asks the equivalent of 80 questions, but in a much shorter format that lets your respondent compare much more easily. So not only can you ask more questions in an easier way, but you get different kinds of responses and impressions depending on how you've set up the question. So these could be mutually exclusive. For example, you could only use hip hop to describe one of the four brands, or you could make it multiple response. So if you thought, to, wanted to let your participants say, okay, I think hip hop applies to all, then they could do that as well. Finally, they're more active. Because you're having the respondents actually do something, they can't just mindlessly fill in blanks, circles, numbers, or check boxes. This improves the quality of the data and also helps keep your respondents interested across the length of your poll. Now, when we think about questionnaire design, if we think about this, it's about decision making and good decision making. When we think about one of our objectives, we're trying to make sure that we have good questionnaire accuracy. That is a focus on measuring the concepts and issues that you actually intend on. And second, that the question itself is relevant. So the information gathered needs to address an explicit research objective. So when you're thinking about the types of questions that you want to ask, there are a number of considerations that you should make as you make that decision. So think about this as a diagnostic tool. The first question is, are these questions needed? Second, is the phrasing clear? It's helpful to have other people take a look at your questionnaires to make sure that it's clear. People who aren't involved in the research and may not have any research background at all. Third, is the sequence productive? Fourth, is the layout helpful? And fifth, have you actually done a bit of pre-testing so that you can revise any problems that you might have? All of these should be conscious questions that you ask when you're putting together some kind of a questionnaire. And these two text boxes, the notion of questionnaire accuracy and relevancy, are the guiding criteria to help you make those decisions. So then when we come back to this notion of asking good questions, because that's really what we're back to, is what are the right ways to ask a question? Because in this case, there are certainly right and wrong ways. So these are the five principal goals when you're developing a questionnaire. Every single question that you ask needs to meet these five goals. First, there needs to be the clear and consistent instructions like we've mentioned. Second, the wording and the intent needs to be unambiguous. Third, they need to make sure that they generate usable and high quality data. Fourth, the question needs to be manageable by the respondent and allow them to truthfully answer. We'll come back to these too. And fifth, is it ethical, fair, and does it not compromise some kind of topic or issue related to the stakeholder? So let's come back to these um, through the next several slides. So first, asking good questions. You can use open-ended questions in questionnaires. That's no kind of problem. Um, but they can pose a problem in terms of letting respondents answer in their own words. The goal with an open-ended question on a questionnaire is to get the respondent to elaborate. So there are a number of advantages and disadvantages. So when we're thinking about open-ended questions, we can think about examples of what do you like most about your job? What comes to mind when you look at this advertisement? A lot of times these will come at the end of a number of other questions that are related. It's a good idea to have these come at the end of a small section of related questions because quite frankly, you give your respondent time to think, time to consider their own opinions. You're more likely to get day good data when you ask them there. But so let's take a look at some of the advantages. These are really useful in exploratory research, especially where we really don't know what the public opinion, what the attitude is with regard to our topic. They're also great because they can reveal unanticipated reactions towards a product, towards a concept, towards whatever problem that we're trying to deal with. And third, they're very good questions because they let the participant expand. 
It can be frustrating if a participant goes all the way through a questionnaire and never has an opportunity to give their mind. Now, some people aren't that interested in doing that. A lot of folks are. But there are some disadvantages. First, because they require an interaction, they can take longer on the questionnaire. They're more, they can be more expensive. Um, and so a lot of times, these are best applied in phone surveys and face-to-face, -face, rather than online questionnaires. Yet that makes it more expensive to administer. Because online, a lot of times, people will ignore it, they'll put down a couple of words, and you may or may not get great data out of it. Second, there's also a potential for interviewer bias. Because people might react to responses, you're those who are actually, if you have some kind of phone or face-to-face -face kind of questionnaire, we as researchers might not always stay on script, but there are any number of subtle and experience issues, so it's really easy to introduce interviewer bias into open-ended questions and questionnaires unless you're asking it in an online environment. So even in the most sincere of efforts, just to have a conversation with someone, we can subtly direct the respondents, or at least they perceive it that way. And most of the time, the respondents are trying to help us out. And finally, it's because longer answers get coded and get analyzed, you can have a little bit of bias enter in because of the sheer amount of data that is conveyed compared to closed-ended kinds of questions. But if we're thinking about asking good questions, when we consider typical survey-based questions, they're fixed answer or fixed alternative questions. But so we can do this in a number of different ways. So fixed and alternative questions are those where respondents are given specific, limited alternative responses and asked to choose the one that is closest to their own viewpoint. These can happen in a number of different ways. There are basically five types of fixed and alternative questions. First are simple dichotomy questions. These require the respondent to choose between one or two alternative, for example, yes or no questions, like, did you make any long distance calls last week? Second are determinant choice questions. These require the respondent to choose one response from among multiple alternatives, for example, if you're interested in their party affiliation, you might ask if they were conservative, Lib Dem, uh, Green, Labor, SNP, or any other kind of option. Third are the checklist kinds of questions. These allow the respondent the ability to provide multiple answers to a single question just by checking off different items. They're useful when you're asking about behaviors that people have engaged in, products people have purchased. You just have to make sure that no two responses would contradict each other. For example, a question like, check the following stores that you have bought electronics from in the last year and list the, the whole group are good options to choose from. Then fourth, and these are probably the most common, are scale questions. These ask people the strength of their beliefs, for example, do you agree, disagree, or the frequency with which a respondent performs a particular behavior. For example, if I asked how often do you play World of Warcraft, the scale might be three to six times a week, one to two times a week, once a month or never. With these questions, you're interested in getting the difference between the levels. The first two types of questions as questions of fact. These get into beliefs, values, or behaviors. The fifth group, though, are se semantic differential questions, and these are used quite a lot as well. They're designed to measure the connotative meaning of concepts. The respondent is asked to choose whether his or her position on a scale between two bipolar adjectives, for example, adequate or inadequate, good or evil, valuable or worthless. So semantic differentials can be used to describe not only people, but also the connotative meaning of abstract concepts and in a capacity that really focuses on different kinds of theoretical benefit. The semantic differential is today one of the most widely used scales in the measurement of attitudes. One of the reasons for this is the versatility of the items. The bipolar adjective pairs can be used for a whole lot of different kinds of subjects. 
But like with any kinds of questions, these have different advantages and disadvantages. So let's take a look at the advantages. First, these types of questions can be used in any mode of delivery, from phone to online to face-to-face. -face. Basically, if someone can read, they can do them. Second, they take less time because they're not dependent on conversation, so it's just quicker. It makes it easier to, to get a lot more participants. Third, respondents know what answers are expected. They can pick an answer versus trying to explain what they think or what they've done. Sometimes our memory or instant recall just isn't as good as, as if we're cued, as if we have responses in front of us. And next, the responses are easier to compare because there are a limited number of predictable categories, so we can directly test if there are differences between them. But, of course, these also carry some disadvantages. First, the range of responses can be limited, but a lot of the reason that you'll see a middle of the road or don't know or even other category is to make the questions exhaustive. This is important because you'd rather have someone fill in one of the less useful responses like, I don't know, than just not answer the question at all. So this is why you want these kind of an exhaustive category with fixed alternative questions. However, the findings also suggest that most people who offer no opinion do actually have an opinion. So if you remove the option, you can encourage a more thoughtful answer. The problem is that you may not have an exhaustive set of options to really encapsulate people's opinions or cope with a genuine don't know option. So in interviewer based surveys, you can deliver the survey to minimize the no option, the no opinion option, but you can still have it available depending on the respondent. But pen and paper or internet ones, you really can't. We also want to consider the respondents, especially if you have a battery of questions. Respondents can get a little bit tired of it and a bit quick in their responses, so they're not reading as well, especially if the questionnaire is a bit long. So this is why you want to minimize the length of the questionnaire and think about the layout to minimize this kind of a potential. When we're developing a good questionnaire, we want to make sure that the questions that we're asking aren't problematic in and of themselves. And so there are five types of questions that we should simply avoid asking on questionnaires. The first is the double negative question. It's a non-standard question that uses two negatives for emphasis when really only one is necessary. So it can be used to express a positive like, she is not unhappy. Another example of, do you not approve of tax reforms? The problem with a double negative question is that it can be confusing. I don't know whether I approve of tax reforms or disapprove of tax reforms based on whether I say yes or no or something on a scale from one to five. A single direct question is important to ask. Second, double-barreled questions are also problematic. These sometimes are called also double direct questions. It's actually an informal fallacy. It's committed when someone asks a question that touches on more than one issue, but really only allows for one particular answer. So this can result in inaccuracies in the attitudes being measured by the question, because really the respondent only can answer one of the two questions, and there's no indication as to which one that they're, they're actually answering. So if you look for an and in a question, you may want to have another look at it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Please agree or disagree with the following statement. Cars should be faster and safer. Well, which is it? If I say yes or answer seven that I strongly agree, is that that I think it should be faster, should be safer, or both? What if I only care about safety and not speed? That's an example of why a double-barreled question is a problem. Another example of one would be, how satisfied are you with your pay and job conditions? I might be very happy with my pay. I might be very unhappy with my job conditions or vice versa, or I could be unhappy with both. But asking a double-barreled question limits the accuracy of knowing what my actual response is. The third type that are problematic are leading questions. A leading question is one that suggests the answer or contains information that the surveyor is looking for. So, for example, if you think about this in, in a police context, you, a policeman might ask, you were at Duffy's Bar on the night of 15th of July, weren't you? This would suggest that the witness was at Duffy's Bar on the night in question. But if you wanted to ask this in a non-leading way, 
where were you on the night of 15th of July? So this form of the question doesn't suggest there is an answer. Because what if you say, well, I wasn't there, you're not answering the question. That also doesn't say, give the information as to where you were. So leading questions may often be answerable with yes or no questions, but certainly not all yes or no questions are necessarily leading. You just have to make sure that you're not assuming too much about what the response is going to be. The fourth type of problematic question are loaded questions. These are also fallacies and are com committed really when a question asks something that is presupposed that ha but hasn't necessarily been proven or accepted by the respondent. Um, they can also contain controversial assertions or even loaded language. So this is usually used as a way to limit the direct replies uh, that someone can, can respond with. It limits the respondent's ability to give an honest and a full answer. An example of this kind of a question is, do you still beat your wife or your husband? Well, if I answer no, that admits that I have a spouse and it admits that I have beat them at some point in the past. So these are facts that are presupposed by the question, so it's problematic. It By narrowing to a single answer, the fact that many questions are being asked, the fallacy is committed. The fallacy relies on the context for its effect. The fact that the question presupposes something does not itself make the question fallacious. Only when someone asks these presuppositions where it doesn't apply. So, for example, in the U.S., when Hillary Clinton was uh, appointed as the Democratic candidate for president, one of the assumptions was that on the part of, the, of a lot of Democrats was that people would be excited about voting for a woman just because it's a woman. Now, in my case, I'm perfectly happy to vote for a woman or not for a woman. That doesn't really matter to me. But the assumption that I would be excited at the prospect of a woman being elected over and above who I might be interested in as a Democrat would be a problematic assumption to make. So this very this loaded question gets asked, but it assumes that anyone should be excited. It puts a value judgment on if you're not excited by Hillary Clinton, and if you're not valuing that over and above anything else. So this is part of the challenge of asking good questions, is that it's your job as a researcher to be neutral. Then the final type of question that can be problematic are burdensome memory questions. Look, people have faulty memories. If the subject isn't recent, then memories can be really unreliable. The cognitive burden can be reduced by using specific reference points. For example, in the last week, in the last month, in the last year, what have you done? It's also about making our questionnaires concrete. If we can avoid these kinds of pitfalls then, and these types of problematic questions, then we're much more likely to be successful in developing our questionnaire. But not surprisingly, it's not just about asking the right kinds of questions, avoiding certain others, but it's also how we put the order together. So if we want to think about the sequence of our questions, we need to think about, first of all, order bias. And this involves primacy and recency. So primacy, what comes first, recency, what comes last. This can affect the way that we deal with and retrieve our thoughts. So primacy effects occur in more written surveys. Uh, the first mentioned response often gets more votes. That's why it's a good idea to mix it up. We even see this in randomization on voting ballots these days, where different candidates, different parties, are not necessarily always placed first on all of the ballots. Recency effects can occur more in conversation-related questionnaires like phone surveys. So the last thing that gets mentioned gets more votes. So the solution is simply to mix up what the values are and what's the impact of them. A second problem in terms of sequencing is the funnel technique. Well, this isn't really so much the problem as the solution. What you want to do, if you think about the format of a funnel, you want to make sure that the questionnaire and the survey is accessible and, and your respondent can move through the questionnaire pretty smoothly. 
So the funnel technique starts with broader, easy questions and then moves to more specific or detailed ones. This helps to acclimate the respondent and to minimize the bias of the responses. Once you introduce a broad topic, then you can narrow it. But so the first question should be related to the topic, should be quick, and should be applicable to everyone. Third are filter questions. This is important in order to make sure that you're getting the respondents that you need. So you want to make sure that your respondents are qualified to answer. So these are the questions that you might ask early on to make sure it's worth the respondents time to answer and that you limit the time to, to actually collect your data. You would hate for someone to get five, six minutes into a questionnaire only to find out, you know, if you're asking about golf brands that they don't golf. What's the point of asking the earlier questions and taking their time if they're not really who you want to talk to? And finally, pivot questions. These are examples or types of filter questions that are used to determine which version of a second question you might be asked. So maybe you have different questions for men and women, for conservatives or for labor or whatever the different groups that might be targeted in your poll. So if they answer that they like a product or are familiar with a product, they might go on to answer different kinds of questions. It, however, if they answer that they don't like a product or unfamiliar with a product, they might have a different route that they take. So pivot questions are about choose your own adventure. It helps to make sure that not everyone is exposed to all the questions, but that if you have different types of groups that you're interested in, you can funnel them into and pivot them into the right kind of questionnaire. So when all of this comes down to it, most of what we're trying to do when we're putting together a good questionnaire is to prevent respondent fatigue. So we want to maximize respondent motivation. So if we think about how to motivate respondents, there are six factors that help to keep them motivated for good information and for good participation. The first is to keep the questionnaire short. Place important questions early rather than later. Second, make sure that you describe the value of the study. Third, provide the clear instructions like we've mentioned and to focus on helping them think carefully. Fourth, obtain their commitment to thinking carefully. If you can focus on information that gets them interested, they're much more likely to make this commitment. Fifth, give booster instructions throughout the poll. Just because you explain what your anchors are strongly agree to disagree doesn't mean that that lasts for a full 5-10 minutes. Make sure that you keep that clear. And then finally, include random probes. Ask why. Even in in online questionnaires, it's good to have some, some short answer responses in order to ensure that people have something different to do. Change up the tasks, change up the style of question, do anything to keep things moving. But beyond the respondent fatigue, we also want to make sure when we're trying to minimize it that we minimize the task difficulty. So again, there are a number of recommendations to make sure that you minimize the task difficulty. First is including text labels. Don't just express numbers. So if you're doing a scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, what does strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, neutral, somewhat agree, strongly agree? That can help to make it easier for them to respond. Second, keep your wording short and concise. Third, Use plain English or whatever language that you're asking questions in, but it should be simple, clear, and concrete. Fourth, focus on current or recent events. Don't ask people about things that happened 30 years ago. Ask them about stuff that matters now. Adapt your, your purpose of your research to make sure that it's relevant and it's something that's actually on people's minds. Ask only one object per question. This avoids those double barrels. Next, keep scales simple and exhaustive. You need to make sure that it's clear what each one means and that you cover the whole range of opinions. And then finally, ask for absolute and not relative judgments, meaning make sure that they give kind of their final word on how this goes. 
if you can do these things, if you both minimize the task difficulty and maximize their interests, you're much more likely to have a successful questionnaire, one that gets good responses and worthwhile responses. Then the final step to all of this is reviewing the questionnaire. Before it goes out into the wild, make sure that you do these following things. First, pre-test with the population that you're interested in, even 10, 15 people, to make sure that the questionnaire is going correctly, that it's working. If you have an online questionnaire, that all the questions work, that they can see them, make sure it's helpful and effective. Second, check your spelling. Have someone else check your spelling. Nothing hurts the credibility of a questionnaire more than having spelling mistakes, typos, things like that. Next, check your scales. Make sure that every scale makes sense, every scale has anchors, and make sure that you your scales fit with the questions that are being asked. And finally, if you're doing it online, do technical checks. Make sure there's no problematic routings, make sure that the, the links work, all the small little details. It's just about making sure that you don't waste any possible respondents on problems or on credibility issues that just shouldn't be there. Now, of course, take a look at your methodology textbooks, and when you're reviewing and developing questions, you should be looking at the previous literature. Most of the time, you should be using established scales. So if you dig into the previous research on your subject, what you'll find is that people have developed surveys and reliable kinds of measures. You should be using those. It's not about reinventing the wheel, but it's about putting your questionnaires together in a way that makes them effective, topical, interesting, so that they can be successful. This has been our podcast on developing questionnaires. Stay tuned for more.